for what you've done in our lives already. We want to change. Some of us have made a decision. Some of us have decided that we're going to go and we don't have to know the details. Some of us, some of us are, have decided that we're going to step out in faith and we don't have to have your itinerary. We don't know, have to know how you're going to do it. We don't have to know when you're going to do it. We're going to believe you, Lord, just because you said so. So we thank you in advance. We thank you for the faith that you're going to give us, Lord. We thank you that you're going to supply the needs for us to go. We thank you that you're going to open up doors that no one has been able to open. We thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do for us. We thank you in advance for the testimonies that are going to come forth from this retreat, Lord. I thank you for what you're going to do. I thank you for speaking. You didn't have to. Have your way, Lord, tonight. Do only as you can do. Speak only as you can speak. We pray your will be done. It may hurt, but your will be done. We may have to cry because we may have to let some things go. But your will be done, Lord. We're going to have to change some things. Some, some people we're going to have to let go. But your will be done. It may cost us before we see the harvest. But your will be done. We may have to deal with the consequences of some decisions that we made. But your will be done. We can do anything with you, Lord. As long as we know that you're on our side, we're safe. We're safe. So we give you thanks. Use me as a vessel. Speak to me what you would have said, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 The people of God were in a night season. In chapter 7, they were in a dark time, a dark place, a time of confusion, a time of oppression, a time of battle with the enemy, a time when they were subject to a unique strategy of attack of the enemy. They were surrounded. One version said that the enemy had laid siege to them. The word siege, we already learned, is a military tactic of surrounding, of cutting them off, not allowing them to come out or to go into the world. Cutting them off, especially from their food supply. Stay with me. So much so that the siege continued until there was a famine. It was not the, uh, a regular famine because there was no food anywhere. It was a famine because there was no, they couldn't get to the food supply. It was a famine in the sense that they were dying of starvation, not because there was no food, they were dying because they were corralled inside the city. The enemy could have just attacked them head on. But rather than do that, it was almost like torture. This time, the strategy was to surround them and just let them die of starvation. We talked earlier about how they tried to make up the difference by eating strange things because of the famine. Mm -hmm. Chapter 7 opens up with a group of men who are lepers. Leper, leprosy was a contagious disease. And if you had it, you were cast out of the community of people. So the Bible says that they were camped out at the gate. Why at the gate? Because they were ceremonially unclean. They were not allowed to go into the city. So get the picture. The people of God are on the inside. 
there's a wall around the city and the four lepers are camped out at one of the gates in the wall. And everybody is surrounded by the enemy. The siege by the enemy led to despair. That's our word, despair. despair. To be desperate means to be hopeless. It means to have or to see no way out. Despair is that position, that set of circumstances in which we see no way out. It implies a lack of resources to progress. Despair means you've concluded that you don't have the resources, you don't have the stuff to move ahead, to move forward, to get beyond where you are. The word despair means to be without hope. The lepers had gotten to the place of decision. They had decided if they stayed where they were, they were going to die. So they decided to take a chance and step out in faith and go into the camp of the enemy. According to our scripture, there was a timing of the blessing. And that's your blank number one. The timing of the blessing. I took, went back and recapped the story because I needed you to see what's going on. Elisha is inside the city with the people who are held captive, who are being besieged in the city. The promise is declared in the city. A decision is being made at the gate. And the enemy is being defeated outside of the gate. You missed it. The promise is being declared inside the gate. The decision is being made at the gate. And the enemy is being defeated outside of the gate. You still don't get it because you would be praising God right now. Let me say it again. The promise is declared inside the gate. The decision is being made outside at the gate, and the enemy is being defeated outside of the gate. When God made the promise, he had already taken care of the problem. He's inside declaring what would be the lepers are making decisions. We're going to step out in faith, but the enemy is already being defeated. When God spoke the word, the catch this. Catch this. What does that mean for you? When God gives you a word, and he gives you a word that it's going to be okay. Yeah. It's already okay. Now they will see this until hindsight. But based on their story, in every other time that God has brought you through in just the right time, can somebody just bless his name for his time?
Now let's look at the tendency of the blessed. That's your blank number two. The tendency of the blessed. There's a certain tendency in us, those who are blessed. Lord, help me with this one. There's something in us. There's something in our humanity. There's something woven in our fragility that causes us to handle blessings in a particular way. Let's go back to our text. Because the Bible says when they got blessed with food, with silver, with clothes, what did they do? They hid it. They hid it. Look at verse 8. And when, the, when these lepers came to the edge of the camp, they went into a tent and ate and drank. And they carried off silver and gold and clothing and went and hid them. Mm -hmm. Then they came back and entered another tent and carried off things from it and went and hid them. Uh -huh. Somebody, I know you see it. They took the blessings and hit it. This speaks of our silent selfishness. The Bible says they went to one tent after another tent and all of the blessings they hid and they weren't going to tell anyone. It speaks of our silent selfishness because God never sent them there for themselves. There's a whole nation Behind walls, yeah, yeah. starving, Man. eating donkey head, yeah. eating bird poop, yeah. eating their children. Yeah. And God sent them to the place of blessing solely that they might take the blessing, turn around, yeah. and bless somebody yeah. else. Yeah. It's silent selfishness. That's right. Okay, right. y'all ain't related to that. <laughs> Some of y'all recently found a sale, and you bought this garment, and you bought those shoes, and it was a deal. Now, what you don't want, you don't want to go to church next Sunday and see your dress and your shoes all over the sanctuary. So you're sitting here, and you're not telling nobody about your deal. <laughs> <laughs> I know that's bad English, but you get my point. You're silent about the blessing you found. You don't want anybody wearing your stuff, so you won't tell anybody where you got it. It's silent selfishness. The truth is, the truth is, and she you know I talking about. The truth is, you're scared they might look better in it. <laughs> Silent selfishness will make you hold on to blessings and not share it. Appreciate yourself, bad. <laughs> Listen to me. They had the blessing. They had food. They had clothing. They had wealth. And they weren't going to tell anyone. Now watch this. Because their selfishness was more than, their silence was more than selfish. Sorry. It was sin. Uh, Go back to the text. And they said to one another, verse 9, we are not doing right. This day is a day of good news. If we are silent, and wait until the morning light. Punishment will overtake us. Now therefore come, let us go and tell the king's household. They said, wait a minute, this is not right. This is a day of good news. And I told you to underline good news. If we wait until daylight, one version says punishment, one version, your Bible may say mischief. If we keep this to ourselves, something is going to happen to us. 
the word for, for punishment, or if your Bible says mischief, or if your Bible says judgment, whatever your Bible says, listen to me, the word means the consequences of a deliberate act. Again, it means the punishment for something that you did that was wrong and you know it was wrong. Let me give it to you again. They said if we don't tell somebody, mm -hmm. something's going to happen to us mm -hmm. because this is wrong. Mm -hmm. The judgment that will come, one version says, the calamity that will come will be justified mm -hmm. because we are wrong and we know we're wrong. Being in despair will cause you not only to do wrong, but knowingly and willingly do wrong. Turning your Bibles with me to James chapter 4 right quick. James chapter 4. Yeah. James chapter 4, verse 17. Get this word. This is your word. It's a hard word, but get it. It's yours. James chapter 4, verse 17. So whoever, whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. That doesn't mean if you don't know it's not sin. It's still sin, even if you didn't know it, it wasn't sin. It's still sin. That means you know what is you know what is right to do, and you don't do what you know is right. Mm. Then you are knowingly not doing what you know is right to do. Did I confuse everybody? No. <laughs> It means you know this is wrong and you will not do what is right. Somebody said it today. I ain't saying nothing to you. You know that's wrong. Hmm. And you make a conscious decision. I know it's wrong and I'm doing it anyway. Do you know anyone Surely not child. Do you know anyone who knows it's wrong but says, I know it's wrong, but I'm going to do it again? The idea of the text is not only that you're sinning, you're consciously, intentionally, and deliberately sinning. You are telling God, I don't care what you say. I know I'm not supposed to say this, but I'm going to say this. Because scripture said, if it don't edify, then. But I need to say this anyway. There's a lot of that going on in the church. What you're doing, you're telling God, I don't care what you say. Despair will make you knowingly sin. Despair will highlight to you that it's not God's will. And because you're desperate, you'll say, I know what's wrong, but I'm going to do it anyway. Do you know anybody who is so deliberately intent on doing what they want to do that they'll still do it, still do it, even if they know it's a sin against God? Let's, do, let's just move on from that. Okay. Amen. Let me know. Holy Spirit is doing this. Number three. The testimony of the blessed. There is a testimony of the blessed. Let's go back to our verse. Verse nine. They said to one another, we are not doing right. They were convicted and they decided. They knew they weren't doing right. And that's the word. See that? Now that's confirmation. You know you're doing wrong. It's okay to stop. It's okay to stop. It's okay to stop mid-sentence. I know sometimes when I'm saying something, and let me, I'm gonna just, I'm gonna just say this. Whenever your gift
gift is. Wherever God has gifted you, best believe that's where the enemy, yeah. that area yeah. is where the enemy always tries to get you to stumble. Because mm -hmm. he's trying to embarrass the kingdom. It really ain't about you. You know it ain't about you, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know the devil really don't care about you. <laughs> He's just trying to make your way. He's trying to kill, steal, and destroy you. Not because of you. He's trying to embarrass the kingdom. Because if he can embarrass the kingdom, if he can have us out here acting crazy to like we don't belong to Jesus, what we do is keep other people from getting saved. That's all that does. You know that, right? You know when you let somebody that's not saved at your job provoke you to act out a character of Christ that is not about you. That's what they're supposed to do. I don't know why we keep act, act, expecting folks that's not saved to act like they saved. If the saved will act like they saved. That's right. <laughs> the testimony of bliss. They said, what we're doing is not good. They were convicted. And they decided to just stop. It's okay to stop. This is a day of good news. If we're silent and wait until morning, like punishment will overtake us now. Therefore, come, let us go and tell the king's household. They said what we're doing is not good because this is a day of good news. Good news is the same phrase for the gospel. This is a gospel day. This is a day where good news is to be proclaimed. They're about to take the good news back to the group that was surrounded by the enemy. The group that is in the camp surrounded by the enemy are the Samaritans. Now, look, I'm just so in love with God's word. So these are the people of Samaria. These are the people, the people of God. Fast forward some generations. Jesus is on the scene yes. on his way to Judea. Yes. And he said, I must pass through Samaria. And on his way passing through Samaria, he decides to stop at his well. He lays on his woman. Well. He has his interchange with his woman at this well that's in the time, in the town of Samaria. And this town, Sychar, that word Sychar means fork in the road, which is a place of decision. Oh, God. So he meets this woman at the place of decision, the same place where the lepers were, at a place of decision. Same people, generations later, offered her life. Offered her the good news. Yes, yes, she yes. accepted this living water. Yes. She went back to her. She went back to her people. And she said, I'll be your living. That is same good news. I love this word. The same good news. They decided we can't keep this to ourselves. Go back to our people and give them the good news. So the lepers make a decision and they say, let's go and tell them. Remember what time of day it is. It's dusk. In fact, if we wait until daylight, something bad is going to happen. So the Bible says when they went back to tell them the story, they went and found the people who were still in the dark. God gave them a word. 
And it was simply come, look, and see what God did. That's all those lepers went back and said. Come, look and see what God did. We've seen it. We've tasted it. We've touched it. And all God wants from you is to go and tell somebody, look what God did. You don't have to learn Greek. You don't have to learn Hebrew. Just tell them what you experienced and what you've seen in your own life. You've got to tell somebody who's walking in darkness that God did it for you. I was in darkness just like you, and God did it. I was in bondage just like you, but God did it. I came out of my darkness and depression, but God did it. I was delivered from the forces of evil, but God did it. I came from a place that was so far down, I didn't think I could get myself back up, but God did it. I didn't know how I would make my way out, but God did it. I look at my children and my children have been kept safe because God did it. God came through for you. 